thing. Anyway, please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago over in the book of Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 15, looking once again at bitter waters and sweet, Naomi in the desert, part 8. There's a lot in this little text here because it gives to us insights into the different forms of rebellion, and we're told that Israel rebelled ten times against God, and as a result, God cut them off. So it is very important for us to learn the principles of rebellion. What it is that makes God so angry. What it is that causes God's people to lose his blessing. What it is when God's people push him so far that finally, like a good coach, he pulls them off of the playing field and puts them on the sideline. Well, they may end up in heaven, though today we're going to see some people who ended up in hell, but they're no longer able to play the game. What are the principles that we have learned and will yet learn concerning both the bitter waters and the sweet? And of course, you understand why it has that title, Naomi in the desert, is because the children of Israel have come to the waters of Mara, the bitter waters. And that's the name that Naomi took for herself. After she returned from Moab, she'd lost her husband, she'd lost her two sons, she lost one of her daughters-in-law, though she did not yet know the treasure that she had in Ruth. But her name means pleasant, Naomi. And she came back and the people said, is this Naomi? And she says, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Lord hath dealt bitterly with me. But even in bitterness, there is joy. And we'll see that as we begin to go through our text and get a little farther into it. Now what we've been discussing is what God does with the people who rebel against his ordained leadership. And we've tried to answer the question, why is rebellion against God's ordained leadership considered rebellion against God? And we saw there were four reasons. Number one, God always provides leadership in every sphere of authority which he has ordained. And we saw there are four categories where the Bible specifically states that God provides intermediate leaders and commands that they be obeyed. That's the home, the church, the government, and the workplace. We studied those areas in some detail, so we'll not go back over it again. The second reason why rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God is because God forbids rebellion to divinely ordained authority. That's an obvious corollary to number one, that God ordained the intermediate authority. But the Bible commands us that we must obey intermediate authority, that is, the divinely appointed leaders in the home, the church, the government, and work, unless that leadership gives commands or prohibitions in contradiction to the Bible. And don't just make it your feelings about the Bible or what you think God ought to have said. You better make sure that if you decide to disobey uh, and authority that God has put there in authority, you have specific reasons and can prove it from Scripture. When you rebel against divinely qualified and appointed authority, you are directly disobeying a command of the Bible. So God says it is rebellion against him. The third reason why rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God is this. Rebellion against authority is an accusation against God that he doesn't know what he's doing that he was foolish or stupid in when he placed those leaders in ministry and authority. Fourth, the fourth reason why rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God is this. Rebellion against authority is an attempt to establish your own personal authority, and that always stems from pride. You can always trace it back to pride. That's very dangerous. That was the sin of the devil, and we studied that in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15. Then we moved out of rebellion theory and moved into rebellion application. And you know how it works? We always ask the question, what's the minimum I have to do and still be in compliance with the letter of the law? We're always looking as people for loopholes, uh, trying to find some more pleasing options than what we know God wants us to do. That brought us to our most recent study. Uh, remember in our text, Exodus 15, 22 through 27, we're studying Israel's rebellion in the wilderness wanderings. When we apply rebellion theory and the biblical response, we see it covers group rebellion as well as individual rebellion. In other words, what if there are multiple leaders in one of the divinely ordained spheres of authority? That's an important question that the Bible answers clearly, or more precisely, 
What if there are multiple leaders and what if there is disagreement among the leaders? What do you follow? The answer, and we gave this two weeks ago, in short, God never ordains a dual role leadership without giving one of the leaders the final authority. God always appoints one of the leaders as the principal leader if that question arises. We saw lots of illustrations of rebellion through manipulation in the family context in that sphere of authority, but the principle also applies to the church, to work, and to government. In that different realm of authority, which related both to religious authority and the authority of the government, we saw some illustrations in the life of Moses when Miriam, Moses' older sister, and Aaron, Moses' older brother, decided to co-opt or preempt Moses' leadership. They had five reasons. They're listed for us in the text. I'll summarize them for you very quickly. Number one, Moses had done something they thought was stupid and culturally unacceptable. Uh, Moses married the Ethiopian woman. That's Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. They spoke against Moses because Moses married the Ethiopian woman for he'd married an Ethiopian woman. Number two, they outnumbered him. There were two of them and there was only one of him. Number three, they were older than he was. This older brother and older sister. Number four, they'd been around serving the Lord longer than he had. All this stuff comes out as you read Numbers chapter 12. And fifth, I mean, we can sort of paraphrase it. They were probably saying something like, listen, Moses, while you were living in the luxury of Pharaoh's palace for 40 years, and while you were fooling around in the desert for another 40 years, we were suffering under the oppression of Pharaoh. After all, fair is fair. We ought to have some say in the matters as well as our kid brother. After all, we're the ones with the experience. And we saw that those reasons are all very stupid and have logical fallacy because they omit the key premises. There are two key premises. Number one, who ordained the multiple levels of authority? Answer, God. Ooh, you're going to argue with God. It's not Moses you're arguing with, you're arguing with God. Number two, who has the ultimate authority placed in the pool of intermediate authorities? Everybody under God is an intermediate authority. The question is, who's the principal intermediate authority? Phrasing it that way gives us clarity to that principle. So uh, Moses wins that argument. And of course, you know what happened. The Lord came down on the pillar of clouds, stood in the door of the tabernacle, called for Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, hear now my words. If there are a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in my, all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth. In other words, I'm doing better for Moses than I do for the prophets. And you're arguing with Moses? No, you don't have an argument with Moses. You've got an argument with me. Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. That is Aaron, Aaron and Miriam. And he departed. And behold, Miriam became leprous. And you know the rest of the story. She shut out of the camp for seven days uh, before she is let back in. And then the people move after seven days and they pitch in the wilderness of Paran. Now, in that passage, we saw that it dealt with two individuals. But rebellion theory gets more complex because last week I gave you another example that was far more serious. That was Korah and company, a group of subordinate leaders who were killed for their rebellion to Moses and Aaron. God's principal intermediate authorities in the secular realm, Moses, and in the religious sphere, Aaron. A group of rebellious leaders impacted an entire nation. Or today we could say a group of rebellious leaders could impact government and the church and bring upon themselves judgment. Numbers chapter 16, verse 1, And Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab and On, and the sons of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And we saw that there are two different groups of rebels listed for us here. We see them dealt with in different ways as we get farther into the text. There were the religious rebels, There were the 250 Levites who were associated with Korah, who was a Levite. And there were the secular political rebels, those who were from the tribe of Reuben, those who were associated with um, Dathan and Abiram. It's very interesting as you look at that, because the secular political rebels refused to obey the secular authority appointed by God. But the religious rebels attempted to do something in a religious sphere in disobedience to what God had assigned. So there are two different groups of rebels, but they join forces together, the political and the religious, but they both have different end, res- end goals. One of them wants to do something that they're not permitted to do, and the other one just wants to get rid of the political authority that's over them and take authority for themselves. In both cases, the rebels receive the divine death penalty. 
Number 16, too, they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. These were no Mickey Mouse. These were not a bunch of guys who were sort of tired of their uh, dole on the government welfare. These were guys who were leaders. Verse 3, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you. There's false premise number one. Seeing all the congregation are holy. That's a true premise, but it's misapplied and mixed with a false premise. Every one of them, and the Lord is among them. That's another true premise. Wherefore then, and here's a false premise, lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. They start with the false premise. They give you two premises which they're mixing in, and they close with the false premise in their accusation against Moses and Aaron. In other words, since A is true, that is, we're all holy, therefore B is true. That is, we all have equal authority, but that doesn't necessarily follow. And therefore, C is not true. In other words, you don't have final authority because we all have equal authority. So they start with something that moves to something even weaker and something moves to something even weaker until they finally reach a false conclusion. That's typical reasoning, by the way, of subordinate authorities when there's a power struggle with intermediate authority appointed by God. Verse 4, And when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him, even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. Very interesting response of Moses. He doesn't argue and say, look, don't you remember when? He says, look, okay, we'll put it to the test now. That brings us to today. That brings us to our next principle, which is always test false premises by the word of the Lord. Always test false premises by the word of the Lord. Okay, Moses says, we're going to let God make the decision. Now, for us, we don't have the Shekinah glory appearing and God doing things where we've got new revelation involved and where we've got sudden judgments coming from God. For us, the final authority is the Bible. But this is where we test the false premises. They're going to test it by what God says the next day. We can test it by what God has already said in his word. But always test false premises according to the word of the Lord. Tomorrow the Lord will show who are his. Now God made a choice back there already, and Moses knows it. They know it. They don't like it. He says, okay, let's test it. Let's ask God to once again make it clear who are his, make it clear who is holy, make it clear who can come near unto him. See, this is this group of Levites that says, how come Aaron gets to do what he gets to do and we don't get to do that? How come we can only go so far, but he gets to go into the Holy of Holies every year, once a year on Yom Kippur? How come he has priority over all the rest of us Levites? We're all descended from Levi. Aaron's descended from Levi. Moses was also descended from Levi. You know that. They were brothers. How come Aaron gets to do all that religious stuff that we don't get to do? Even though they got an opportunity to do a lot. And each of the three different divisions of the Levites got to do certain very special things in relation to the tabernacle as it moved through the wilderness. But they wanted what they couldn't have. How many of us have been in that situation? We have all kinds of privileges. We have all kinds of blessings. But we want what God says we can't have. We need to learn from this. These guys were religious leaders. Now, you know, in the body of Christ, we're all equal. We all stand at the same level when we stand before the throne of God. We're all equal. But God doesn't give all of us the same spiritual gifts. You know that. We've studied that. We've studied the gifts of the Spirit. We've studied the 19 different things that you probably have the few that you don't have. We've studied the spiritual fruit that all of us are supposed to be bearing. But we're not supposed to mix those things up. There are certain gifts that God has given in the body of Christ, which are leadership gifts, and not everybody has those. And yet there are those who want them. And you see this happening in the, what I call the pagan churches, 
They call themselves churches, they call themselves Christians, but they sure don't follow the Bible, where they're appointing women as pastors, where they've got homosexuals as pastors, where they've got lesbians as pastors. You see it in the type of worship, where instead of worshiping God according to the principles, which we have studied in a great deal of detail when we went through music and talked about music in the Bible, and they're bringing in Baal worship because it attracts people and it gets them all warm and fuzzy and gets their bodies moving and jiggling and shaking under the strobe lights and blasting their eardrums out so they can't hear the word of God. All they can hear is noise. Dear people, the flesh always wants what God says no to. Always. Your flesh will always want what God forbids. And here we have it. They had all kinds of privileges. And it's true, they were all equal in a certain sense, just as we are, but God had appointed leadership there. And so Moses says to Korah and all that group of Levites that were with him, <coughs> come on tomorrow and God will make the decision. He will cause him to come near unto him, even him whom he hath chosen. You know, it's not you that makes the choice. God that makes the choice. Now, as good Presbyterians, we all believe in election. God's the one who sovereignly made the choice in eternity past to save some and condemn others. Election and reprobation. Although some people go weak on reprobation. And then we turn around, and in the practical realm of real life, what we call real life, we say, well, God can't make those choices. We're going to make those choices, and we're going to do it the way we want to do it. Dear people, that's exactly like Korah and company. Don't do that. Make sure you're following what God's word has to say on every issue and not making it up as you go along. Otherwise, you are in very serious trouble. And so we get down here to verse 6. Now, remember we're talking about always test false premises according to the word of the Lord. That's what Moses is doing here. This do. Take you censors, Korah and all his company. Now, that was not people who sit and look at movies and say, that's a bad movie, we're going to put an R on it, or an X on it. Uh, a censor, C-E-N-S-O-R, means a little dish where they put the incense and hot coals on it, and it burns the incense and gives off this fragrant smoke. Think sort of like the, the, the Statue of Liberty with the scales of justice holding out there. Uh, and she's blindfolded and can't see which way the scales are tipping. Just take one half of that with a little chains going up and that little plate at the bottom and you put your coals and your incense in there and you carry that in. And it's lifting, it's bringing incense into the Holy of Holies as you walk forward into the tabernacle or later into the temple. Moses says, okay, here's a very important privilege. Let's see if, uh, if God has chosen you guys or if he's chosen Aaron. After all, there are 250 of you. I mean, is God going to turn down 250 really qualified, really good guys who are descended from Levi? Is he going to say, is you just sort of put up a wall and you go, walk into the wall? What's God going to do about it? Let's see tomorrow what he does. Take you censors, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be. Now notice, Moses uh, sort of gives a hint as to what he knows is going to happen. And the man, not the men, the man, not plural, singular, and that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Holiness is not a matter of what you're doing. It's a matter of God setting you apart. That's what the word holy means, to set apart. To be set apart for a specific service to God. Our lives should reflect that in the way in which we live, a separated life. You can read it on the wall behind me. That holiness is demonstrated in real life, but the call to holiness, the choosing to holiness, the placing of holiness in the life of the believer is the work of God. 
He's the one who has called you, ordained you, and put you in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1. Six times it tells us there that we're in Christ, in him, in the beloved. And we didn't put ourselves there. It was God who put us there. So he says, all right, that man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. And then he shakes his head because he knows what's going to happen. Remember, God speaks face to face with Moses. He doesn't just speak in a vision or a dream. He speaks face to face with Moses. Moses knows what's going to happen. He knows God personally. He's speaking to the resident of the Shekinah. He's speaking to the pre-incarnate Christ as he did at the burning bush. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. He's a Levite too, but he's talking to his cousins. And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi. This is the rebellious religious group. The ones who want to do what they're restricted from doing. This is not the Dathan and Abiram group. This is the Levites that we're dealing with here. Dathan and Abiram are going to get their comings up too. But right now, we're faced with the Levites. So we come to another principle. Don't let intermediate or subordinate authority give you a fat, proud head or cause you to demand rights that God has not given to you. Moses understood that although he and Aaron were both Levites, God had appointed him the governmental head and established the high priesthood through Aaron. That brings us to verse 9. Seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. You see, they had an incredible privilege already. He has separated out that entire tribe. They were going to get to participate in all the ties that were brought by all the rest of Israel. They were going to have Levitical cities. They were going to have the cities of refuge. They were going to get to go in their courses, 12 different courses, up to the city of Jerusalem when the temple was built so that they could participate by courses. And you know, one of them, by the name of Zacharias, was of the course of Abiah. And we're going to be learning about him more as we get into the Christmas season. He was of a specific course. There were 12 different divisions of the Levites. And they came by course to Jerusalem. There were, at that time, about 6,000 Levitical priests serving every week in Jerusalem. All divided up in the 12 courses. He says, do you think that's no big deal? You snuffing your nose at the privilege that God has given to you as Levites? And you want the high priesthood too? You want to sort of have it as shift off and we all get to be high priest every now and then? And it's sort of by popular vote we'll do the congregational thing like a lot of churches do. And by popular vote we'll get this guy. Wait a minute. Doesn't God have something to say about this? Seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel has separated you. He's called you out. Set apart the Levitical tribe from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle. We talked about the three different divisions of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. Verse 10, And he hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee. And seek ye the priesthood also? Never demand that God give you something that he hasn't given to you. There are too many people who want to push for top dog. There are too many people that want to say, hey, look, I'm just as good as he is, or I'm just as good as she is, and hey, I don't have to do that. We saw both different kinds here. Those who are openly rebellious, sort of come forward like warlords, and those who simply sit in their tents and say, we're not going to come even though you told us to come. We'll do our own thing, and we don't care if you said to come. Both are rebels, and both get killed. 
you hear that? That's the death penalty we're talking about. And God certainly is righteous and just and quite capable of dishing out the death penalty when he wishes to do so. He hath brought you near unto him and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi and thee, and to seek the priesthood also, for which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you murmur against him? You see, Moses goes back, he cancels out, with one sentence, he cancels out all the false premises that they had brought against him and against Aaron. You guys have set yourselves up above the people of the Lord. Don't you understand that the whole congregation is holy? So why do you think that if the whole congregation is holy, you're better than the whole congregation? Moses kills that all with one sentence here. Thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. Exactly what we've been talking about. Rebellion against God's ordained authority is rebellion against God. Hey, the intermediate authority, that is whoever God has ordained, it's no big deal. See, this is the group that's really in rebellion, not against Moses, but against Aaron. What is Aaron that you murmur against him? Pay attention to the text. We tend to lump this whole group all together. It's two separate groups, two separate sets of complaint, but they're joined together because they want to get rid of the two top dogs that God has put in there. Get rid of Moses as the governmental leader. Get rid of Aaron as the religious leader. And then they'll sort of just sort of shuffle it off and see who can fight it out and get up to the top first. That's not the way God works. God has ordained the four spheres of authority. In each sphere of authority, God has put top leadership. And you better follow the principles that relate to that, otherwise you're in the same problem that Israel had in the Old Testament. Do you understand the New Testament tells us specifically that God gave us all of these stories about all of these people who really lived, who really died, who really went through these problems, so that we won't fall into the same kind of sins that they fell into. I mean, that's not the New Testament church we got in the Old Testament, but that is an illustration for us of how God works with God's people. So, that brings us to three important danger signals or danger signal principles that we learn from these verses. I hope you're taking notes. This will really help you when you're trying to discern what's going on when you see a situation where there seems to be some chaos in terms of leadership. Principle number one. Principle number one is there are two types of rebels. There are two types of rebels. The first type are open rebels who willingly come at you face to face to fight. That's this Korah and his company. They're the ones that stomp up and say, we're taking over. I've told you about a situation that where I was uh, an associate pastor in a church years and years and years ago. I, I hadn't gotten out of seminary yet, but this was happening at the church uh, where my dad was the pastor, where a group of people marched into the church one day and told them that, I mean, it was during a worship service. And they told my father and the elders that the Shekinah glory of God had appeared to them in a ball of fire and had told them to take over the church. And they marched in that day and they said they were taking over the church. <laughs> Fortunately, the church was a corporation, nonprofit corporation. My father, who, as one man once said, when your dad walked in, authority just walked into the room. <laughs> he told them, well, listen, you can't do that because we have to have at least two weeks to call a congregational meeting. You can't just take over the church. It's a corporation. So for two weeks, they tried to raise the, you know, the, the level of support that they had. And they came to that meeting, so the congregation could vote on it, and they presented their case, and the elders presented the case of the church and said, we're not going to do this. The one young man stood up. He's a judge in Texas today. Uh, he was a teenager then, 19 years old. He stood up and said, I think we need to pray about it more. He was part of the family that had seen the ball of fire. And um, anyway, one old lady in the church took her cane and shook it at his face. Her name was Mrs. Means. <laughs> She shook it right in his face. She said, you sit down, young man. We've been praying for two weeks. And he sat down. And they voted. And that group was voted out. And they went and split three or four other churches in San Antonio. But the next week, there were more people in church there at Grace Bible Church in San Antonio than we had had ever before. Overflowing. 
healthy body has to eliminate every now and then, and then it grows. People, this is what's going on here. There are two types of rebels. Number one, open rebels. This principle number one of the danger signals. Open rebels who come at you face to face and want to fight. The second type, this is still principle one. Second type are the recalcitrant rebels who stubbornly refuse to do what they're told to do. They always sit there and say, we're not going to do it and we don't care what you say. They're rebels too. You know they end up getting killed too. Well, we didn't do anything. That's the whole point. You didn't do anything. You were supposed to follow the leadership that God ordained. The church always has both types working in unison to try to hinder appointed leadership. Principle number two of the danger signal principles. Principle number two, those inside the church compose two different groups. Those outside the church who attack the church are the enemy. They also fall into two categories as well. So you got the people in the church, the two types of rebels we talked about first. Then you've got the people outside the church. They fall into two categories. Number one, open attackers. And you see that going on in our society today where lots of churches are coming under attack. And then you've got infiltrators, the open attackers and the infiltrators. That's one of the problems that fundamentalists have always had with neo-evangelicals, because neo-evangelicals are trying to use the ways of the devil. They say, well, what we'll do is we'll infiltrate their churches. We'll call them brother, and, you know, they'll call us brother and call us doctor, and so on, and so we can have an influence and impact. No, no, no. God doesn't have to infiltrate. He doesn't have to infiltrate. We don't have to do that. That's the devil's schemes. When you come to enemies, you've got the enemies who are open enemies. You've got the infiltrators. Principle number three of the danger signals infiltrators also fall into two groups. So we're seeing a division, division, division as we move down this ladder so that you'll be able to identify and say where do they fit in the categories here. Number one, those who are like spies from an open enemy. You know, and we're going through all this stuff with our government right now. Did, you know, Russia, you know, do something bad in our elections and all this and was the Trump campaign involved in it? You know, you've got those who are open spies from an open enemy. And number two, and this is perhaps the one that is most dangerous, especially in a church like this, where there have been lots of splits in the past and people have gone out. Number two, there are those who used to be part of the church, but who left for carnal reasons and are now seeking to worm their way back into the church. Folks, I've been in ministry for, what, 45 years, something like that. And I've seen this every place I've gone. People who left the church for carnal reasons, they used to be part of it, but they're now seeking to worm their way back into the church so they can cause division and chaos and destruction and usually for their own pocketbooks reasons. Okay, so that brings us now to verse 12. We're in number 16. Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram. Now we've got the second group. The sons of Eliab, these are the guys from the tribe of Reuben, remember? They're not religious, and they, they know they can't participate in all that religious stuff, so they, have, they haven't bothered to come with Korah and his company. But Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, we will not come up. Yeah. So what are you going to do about it? <laughs> See if you can do anything about it. See if you can make us do it. We're not going to do it. We don't like to do it. We're not going to obey you. We don't, we don't have to. You know, don't you realize? Oh, we're free American citizens. We don't have to do that. Oh, different group. And listen what they say. Is it a small thing that thou, you Moses, has brought us up out of the land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us. Now wait a minute. Here's, here's what Dathan and Abiram are saying. Is it a small thing that you, Moses, have brought us, Dathan and Abiram and all the children of Israel, you brought us up out of a land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness. Now wait a minute. Milk and honey, is that, is that the way they thought about Egypt when they were back in Egypt? That was the land of milk and honey. I mean, have you heard that phrase before? Was it used in relation to Egypt? 
No. It's used in relation to the land of promise where God has called them. And look at their accusation. The only reason you wanted to bring us up was to kill us so you could make yourself a prince over us. Now, wait a minute. If he kills you, he's not going to be a prince over you. He's not going to have any people. You really think that Moses was trying to kill you so that he could be a prince over a bunch of dead bodies rotting in the wilderness? Do you understand the stupidity of that kind of an argument? You know, rebels always bring false accusations to take the spotlight off themselves. You know, we learn six false accusation techniques used by the rebels in this text. There are six techniques. Let me give you the techniques. Don't you ever use these. You're getting in trouble. Technique number one is word twisting. They use the phrase, land of milk and honey. They didn't use the phrase, brought us up from the land of slavery. <laughs> that was technique number one, is word twisting. Technique number two, they serious, gave a serious slander of the intent of the leader. Here's your intent. It was to kill us. Folks, that's slander. Do you think Moses wanted to go back to Pharaoh? If you read the text, you'll discover he didn't want to go. In fact, he used all kinds of excuses like stutter. God, Moses, come on. Who made your tongue? Do you think I can't solve this problem? Moses didn't want to go. But God said, you're going to go. You better go when God says you're going to go. His intent was not to kill them. He risked his life on a daily basis going into Pharaoh. Technique number three. We have false accusation of personal goals and purposes of the leader. Goals and purposes. There will be a false accusation concerning your goals and purpose. To make thyself a prince. Listen. He was giving himself a bunch of headaches, not making himself a prince. The fourth technique is twisting the word of God to mean what it does not say. They were twisting the word of God to mean what it does not say. They had heard the word of God. They had heard it from the lips of Moses. They had heard what he has said to Pharaoh each time that the plagues hit. They had experienced what the plagues were like. They'd seen how it hurt Egypt. They had heard the words of Moses as they stood by the Red Sea. They had seen Moses lift up his rod and the sea was parted. They had walked across the sea. You think, don't you people have any brains? I mean, do you all have Alzheimer's? You don't remember what happened just about a month ago? They obviously didn't. No, they were twisting the word of God to say what it does not mean. In this case, we would say twisting the Bible to say for us we're no longer receiving new revelation what was happening at Moses' time. That brings us to technique number five. Stating what God ultimately would do, but misapplying it. They said, you brought us up to kill us. <laughs> to kill them. <laughs> well, you know what? God was going to do that. They just didn't know it at the time. They were accusing Moses they wanted to kill them. You brought us up to kill us in the wilderness. Stating what God would ultimately do, but misapplying it. God was going to kill them for rebellion. It wasn't Moses who had planned to kill them in the wilderness so that he could be a prince over dead bodies. And number six, the sixth technique. Divine, denying the divine appointment of the leader. I mean, just flat out denying it. That is a technique of rebellion always used. Denying authority. Denying authority. Denying authority. In this case, it was Moses. So that brings us to the next principle. Next, we see their accusation is based on experience. Well, I've had the experience of... Look at all the years of experience I've got. Experience not faith. That's a very popular way of looking at things. Their accusation was based on experience, but not on faith. That's the issue of walking by sight rather than walking by faith. That's a very appealing argument to carnal Christians and to pagans. They say it specifically. Verse 14. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey. Now, wait a minute. 
They had just been talking about the land that flows with milk and honey, so they knew that phrase from someplace. God had told it to them. He was going to take them to milk and honey. And they said, you didn't do it. We left the land of milk and honey. No, if you have any memory at all, it was a land of slavery. It was not a land of milk and honey. It was a land of slavery. You wanted to get out. It was very bitter bondage for you in Egypt. But what you remember is the leeks and the lentils and the garlics. Dear people, don't be selective in the way you view the workings of God in the world. Listen to what they say. They wanted to walk by sight, not by faith. Thou hast not brought us to a land that floweth with milk and honey, or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Now look at it. Here's our experience. Here's what we can see. Notice this at the end of verse 14. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We can see what's going on. We have experience. We see that we're in a desert. We used to be there in Egypt and we had all this good stuff. Forget the bad stuff for a minute. All the good stuff. You're going to put out our eyes? And then their statement of rebellion. We will not come up. Have you ever been in that situation? Somebody in authority has told you to do something? Begged you to do it? Encouraged you in every way that you possibly could to do it? And you said, we got good reasons. We will not come up. Yeah. So what you going to do about it, Charlie? You can't make us. Moses didn't have to make them. Because God had appointed Moses. God, though very patient and long-suffering, would deal with them. Can't believe our time is up. But let me give you one more principle. False accusations are always very pious, religious-sounding, pompous, and self-serving. Even when a leader has served sacrificially, I might say without pay, Moses says so in the text. Verse 15. Moses was very wroth and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. Moses was serving a group of jerks. He was doing it sacrificially. He was doing it with a lot of headache. But you know, he said, Lord, don't respect their offerings. They're trying to be pious. They're trying to say, you haven't done what you said you were going to do. You haven't brought us to the land flowing with milk and honey. We left the land flowing with milk and honey. You think we're blind? You see, the people were walking by sight and not by faith. The Bible says that for the believer, we walk by faith and not by sight. There's a lot more here in this passage. We'll have to pick it up next week. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. It has so much to say to us because this just is Moses and the children of Israel. You're establishing principles by which you function and demonstrating through living illustrations who are now dead, but who were alive at that time, how you deal with your people. You are indeed patient and long-suffering. You indeed give them many opportunities to repent. You indeed put up with them over and 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 over again. The Father finally judgment falls. Help us to understand the principles of rebellion. 
help us to understand how you deal with rebellion because it's rebellion against you ultimately in the long run when all is said and done rebellion against divinely ordained and appointed authority in any of the spheres of authority is rebellion against you the living God and you are sovereign and you will not tolerate it you will judge so father we pray that you'll take the things that we've studied today and use them for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ use them in our hearts Cause us to be a people who loves you, who willingly serves you, who functions in each sphere of authority as you have ordained it so to be, instead of making excuses about how bad authority is. Help us instead to do what's right. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 680, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Even as God led the children of Israel in the wilderness, so he leads us today and he leads us through his word. Let's turn to number 680 and we'll stand to sing all the verses of all the way my Savior leads me. <laughs>